A 12-hour vigil is being held at Nathan Phillips Square to remember the Palestinian lives that have been lost over the last 12 months. Chris Glover is at the vigil. And Chris, what are organizers there telling you about this event? Hey, Dwight. Well, there's certainly a somber mood here as this 12-hour vigil begins this morning at 8 o'clock. It's going to go straight through the day to 8 p.m. And right now we're just hearing from speakers. People are sharing some personal stories, emotional stories about how the conflict has continued to impact their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Many of them have loved ones who are back in Gaza, in the West Bank, who are caught up in this violence. And what we're seeing here also is things like this uh, little makeshift tombstone that has been put up here. Just another reminder of the lives who have been lost. I spoke with one woman who is here today to have her stories shared. Her family, her entire family, including her father, many of her cousins, they're all back in the West Bank. And she was talking a little bit about the response that she's seeing from her fellow Canadians here in the community. I think it's a very confusing reaction to to the Canadian community. I think, uh, and I and I think it's in part by because of um, the political complicity in this genocide, and quite frankly, the media complicity at the beginning. Um, our voices were silenced. Uh, we were portrayed as terrorists and barbaric, and we were dehumanized and uh, suffered a lot through anti-Palestinian racism, and we continue to, but. I see a lot of encouraging signs that the general public is um, is waking up, is waking up to the reality of what's happening and to our government's complicity. And we're seeing numbers and numbers of people join us in our marches, in our calls to end the genocide. Nobody wants to see genocide, um, but our government needs to do their job. The media needs to do their job, and we need to tell the story, the real story of the people suffering for the last 76 years. What has that been like, uh, seeing your friends, your family members back home struggling and dealing with this, fighting this violence day in and day out for a full year now? Yes. So my family is still in Palestine. I can't go visit because I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to go out. I was there two summers ago and I almost got killed twice, just crossing a checkpoint. So. Those realities of Palestinians are real. That's our daily life. Uh, so what is it like for me to not know if I'm ever going to go see my father again? He's 87. Do I know if I'm going to see my family and my friends? I don't know. It's, it's terrifying. Um, not everybody has a choice to leave. And quite frankly, people don't want to leave. That's their, that's their home. So to me, it's very difficult to exist here and function as a citizen of this of this city and um, meanwhile my entire life is is being torn apart um, across the the ocean so it's very difficult you mess you mentioned um, the West Bank and we know that there's been violence in the West Bank that's not been seen in a couple of decades and then now we're seeing the ground invasion into Lebanon as you see this war progress what are you what are you thinking I think the, the optimistic side of me thinks that it's this is easy to end I think the world should say no enough uh, weapons should stop being you know pumped into this war machine and um, this can easily end like in a week's time but there is no there is no desire to end this this is like part of a, some sort of a restructure project and for me it's terrifying because you know, as a descendant of a Nakba survivor, I know what happened. I know that my mother was never able to go back to Haifa. My mother is going to die not going back to her homeland. So I know, we know, Palestinians, Palestinians know, it's part of our DNA. We know that we know once we are displaced, we, know, we will never be able to go back. So to me, it's, it's very terrifying and people don't, don't see it. People ask me, why, why don't the Arab countries take you? What? Like, what, turns, turn the entire Palestinian population into refugees? And Dwight, back here at the vigil, one thing that you're seeing is that the speakers who are at the front of this audience here, who are sharing their personal stories, they're doing so without 
a mic. And that's because they say that security came out here and told them because they don't have a permit for amplification, they're not allowed to be using it. And it came right at a time as they were talking about being silenced, not having their voices heard. Certainly one of the things that many people in this crowd have talked about, I was asking Mesa for her opinions on that. She said it was a disgrace as they're here trying to get attention to have the mics turned off. Certainly just another little bit of an insult to all of the uh, uh, devastating news that they continue to talk about and to share stories about here at Nathan Phillips Square.